Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's event. I'm Adrian Stone, and along with my colleague, Jason Veruis, I am Director of the Centre of Comparative Constitutional Studies at Melbourne Law School. I'd like to begin today by acknowledging that Melbourne Law School stands on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, which is also where I work and live. I think it's always important, of course, to make this acknowledgement, but particularly given the topic of today's seminar, I want especially to acknowledge the long-standing connection of the Wurundjeri to their traditional lands and the care and custodianship that they have given it. Tonight is the launch of a new series, the CCCS Global Seminar Series. The series is a response to the circumstances of the pandemic. We are fortunately now in a, in a position where many of our events will be returning to in-person meeting and we're greatly enjoying that. But we want to continue the, the online engagement from which we all benefited so much during the years of the pandemic. And so this series has been launched to enable us to do so and it is in place at a time that is enables wide engagement across Australia and globally. So the series will approximately monthly present a discussion of an important issue in public law in Australia or globally. Now I've described it as a new series, but in a sense it, it uh, is a continuation of a long-standing CCCS tradition of engaging well beyond our own internal academic community to a much broader academic professional community in Australia and globally. And so this series is an exciting new series that also continues a long-standing practice. And fittingly, we begin with, with a discussion of this incredibly important topic, Aboriginality and alienage. And with that, I'd like to turn over to my colleague, Professor Kirsty Gover, who will be the chair this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. Um... Much appreciated. Um, I also want to acknowledge the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which the law school stands and where I am today in Nam. Uh, I acknowledge also the traditional owners of the lands where you all are in Australia or elsewhere and all of the Indigenous people who are joining us today for this important conversation. I also want to pay my respects to the Kati Mamoi Naitahu people of Aotearoa to wife Honamu on whose land I was born and raised and to all the Māori whānau affected by the subject matter we are discussing here today. Uh, my name is Kirsty Gover, as Adrian said, I'm a professor here at the Melbourne Law School and I co-direct our Indigenous Law and Justice Hub with Dr. Eddie Cavillo. It's my pleasure as chair to introduce our panellists, Tony McAvoy and Cheryl Saunders, and then to make some preliminary comments about our topic today. Tony McAvoy, I think many of you will know, given the subject matter, is a, he's a wordy man from the central Queensland area around Claremont and a native title holder in his grandmother's country around Thagaminda in southwest Queensland. He is currently serving as the Northern Territories Acting Treaty Commissioner. Tony is a barrister and was appointed as senior counsel in 2015. He's developed a strong native title practice and has significant experience in many other areas of law. He's also, I should say, a very good friend of the Indigenous Law and Justice Hub and he serves on our advisory board. So Tony, I thank you on our behalf for all of your generosity. My colleague Cheryl Saunders is Laureate Professor Emeritus at the Law School, and she is the founding director of the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies that's hosting this event. Cheryl has specialist interests in Australia and comparative public law, including comparative constitutional law and method, intergovernmental relations, constitutional design and change, and she's held innumerable important leadership roles in professional and academic associations active in those fields. I would like to say at the start of today's conversation that questions of Indigenous identity are, of course, deeply personal and very complex. In many respects, the fact that these matters are before the High Court is far from ideal because it means they will be debated by judges and lawyers who are non-Indigenous and discussed in the rather cold and abstract terms uh, demanded by settler law 
I think we should not forget today that these questions are fundamentally about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families and all of their efforts over the generations to stay together and survive settler colonialism. The purpose of today's uh, session or one of its purposes is to highlight what's at stake in this case, especially for Indigenous peoples, and to start to generate a conversation that will encourage informed public and academic debate on these issues. I should say the case is a very complex one with lots of moving parts. And I know that we're joined today by colleagues and friends from outside the world of law. So we panelists don't propose or uh, purport to convey the full nuance of the legal arguments that will be put before the court next month on April 6th and 7th to be exact. And I should also note that the submissions of the intervening parties, including Indigenous organisations, have not yet been filed. They are due this week. So we have not yet had the benefit of hearing those critically important voices on the matter. And so what we've done is we've invited our guests, Tony and Cheryl, to comment really on any aspect of the case that they find interesting and significant. And our plan as panelists is for each of us to speak for 10 or 15 minutes, after which there'll be time for me to field questions and comments from you all. Uh, and you should ask those via the Q&A function in Zoom, please. So we decided together that in my role of chair, it might be helpful for me to set the scene for those less familiar with uh, the Montgomery proceedings. So in the time that I have, I propose to briefly explain the precedent in Love Tom, set out the facts relating to Mr. Montgomery, which have led to this appeal, and then very briefly outline some of the central parts of the party's arguments. So in brief, in the Montgomery proceedings, the appellants, the Minister for Immigration and the Commonwealth, and I will use the shorthand Commonwealth, argue that the Love Tom's decision handed down in February 2020 should be reopened and overturned, that it was wrongly decided, and that in any case, the respondent, Mr Montgomery, is not an Aboriginal person because they argue he does not show that he has Aboriginal biological descent. This appeal takes place in circumstances where two of the majority judges in Love Tom's, Justices Nettle and Bell, have retired in the period of little over two years since the Love Tom's decision was handed down. Two new judges have joined the High Court bench, Justices Gleeson and Stewart. So the Love Tom's precedent, in short summary, a majority of the court four judges decided that non-citizens who are Aboriginal Australians are not aliens within the meaning of that term in the constitutional aliens power. Accordingly, Aboriginal Australians are not vulnerable to exercises of power, such as visa cancellation and removal powers contained in the Federal Migration Act, because those parts of the Migration Act depend um, on the aliens power. In short, non-citizens who are Aboriginal Australians are not aliens and cannot be deported. The Love Tom's majority arrived at this finding by determining that the federal parliament may not treat as an alien a person who could not possibly answer the description of alien according to the ordinary understanding of that word. And this is known as the Pochi limit to the alien's power um, derived from Pochi and McPhee. In that ordinary understanding, the majority held Aboriginal people cannot be aliens because the common law recognises and has for a long time recognised their unique spiritual connection to Australian land and waters, that connection being explained in slightly different ways by each judge and the majority. All agreed that this connection was of the most profound importance to Aboriginal people and communities. And as Justice Gordon said, it is a connection that is older and deeper than the Australian constitution. It is, as some judges pointed out, drawing on the Gove land rights case, a fundamental truth in which spirit ancestors, people, the land and everything that exists on it and in it are organic parts of one indissoluble whole. The question then to be answered is who is an Aboriginal person who has this connection and thus falls into the category of Aboriginal non-citizen, non-aliens? And the majority answered this question by reference to a test set out by Justice Brennan and Mabo No. 2 back in 1992, which provides that membership of the Indigenous people depends on biological descent from the Indigenous people and on mutual recognition of a particular person's membership by that person and by the elders or other persons enjoying traditional authority among those people. <clears throat> 
the majority judges to leave open the possibility that a different test might be more appropriate in the context of alienage. But they said they did not to decide, need to decide what the outer limits of that other test might be, given the case at hand. But for example, Justice Edelman said the Mabo test can be usefully applied in this case in Love Tom's. However, he said it's not set in stone, particularly as an approach to determining Aboriginality as a basis for those fundamental ties of political community in Australia, which are not dependent upon membership in a particular subgroup. A contender for an alternative broader test mentioned by some of the judges in the Love Tom's majority is one called the Tasmanian Dam test derived from Justice Dean's comments in the Tasmanian Dam case. Uh, considering the meaning of the phrase Australian Aboriginal in relation to the race power, I should say it's not the only contender for an appropriate test, there may well be others. The Tasmanian Dam test provides that an Australian Aboriginal means a person of Aboriginal descent, albeit mixed, who identifies himself as such and who is recognised by the Aboriginal community as an Aboriginal. You'll note that both tests require descent and that the Mabo test refers to biological descent, but neither elaborates in its own context on what constitutes proof of biological descent. And it's important, I think, uh, to remember that the Mabo test is a test of membership in a particular people, whereas the Tasmanian Dam test is more properly understood as a test related to general Aboriginality. A related and important difference is that the Mabo number two test requires recognition by elders or other persons enjoying traditional authority, as opposed to recognition by the relevant Aboriginal community in the Tasmanian Dam test. To further complicate the matter of these two tests, the federal court authorities we have on the application of a legislative version of the broader test, the Tasmanian Dam test, have suggested that community recognition in some circumstances can be probative of biological descent. Likewise, in the native title context, some native title determinations refer to cultural adoption um, as a way to gain membership in the community. And some of those determinations seem not on their face to require biological descent. And that's said, leaving aside the operation of the act itself, the Native Title Act. So, Australian law has recognised the importance of community recognition in determining a person's Aboriginality and membership. The question remains which community for which purpose, and also by whom within that community. And these are complex political and legal questions, and as you might expect, there's a wide range of views in the community about how these different variables and criteria should be aligned or brought into relationship with one another in any given context. And that brings us to the situation facing Mr Montgomery. So Shane Montgomery is a New Zealand citizen. He was born in New Zealand. He's not an Australian citizen. He says that he is an Aboriginal Australian because as a Mulanjali man, he has been adopted into the Mulanjali people in accordance with their traditional law and custom and by people enjoying traditional authority. He was told by his New Zealand Maori family members that his Ngāpui ancestors married into an Aboriginal clan at some point. His mother also has a very long ancestral connection to Australia. But as he says in his words, I do not know if I am directly descended from Aboriginal ancestors. Mr Montgomery is now around 40 years old. He arrived in Australia as a teenager. He was placed in a shelter for homeless Aboriginal young men. He was taken in by a Munanjali family, eventually going through ceremony and being initiated into that community. As an adult, he had many encounters with the police. And in 2018, he was sentenced to a term of 14 months imprisonment so that his visa was consequently canceled. And then he was placed in immigration detention in early 2019, the minister declined to revoke that cancellation and Montgomery brought proceedings in the federal court. In that court, Justice Darrington decided that because of the decision of the High Court in Love Tongs, 
Montgomery could only be detained if the detaining officer reasonably suspected that he was not an Aboriginal Australian. The judge noted, and this is a quote, Mr. Montgomery made representations that decision that the decision in love did not foreclose a finding that he was a biological descendant of Aboriginal people by traditional law and custom. It was accepted by the minister that he both identifies as an Aboriginal Australian and he's been accepted by a traditional Aboriginal group as a member of that group. In these circumstances, the suspicion held by the relevant officer that Mr Montgomery is not an Aboriginal Australian was not reasonable, end quote. Accordingly, the judge held the burden then shifts to the minister to show that the detention is lawful and this the minister had not succeeded in doing. As she noted, there is no room for any presumptions in favour of, in favor of the executive. This is the judge, Judge Justice Darrington. There is no room for any presumptions in favour of the executive where the liberty of the subject is concerned. Accordingly, she ordered a writ of habeas corpus, which means essentially Montgomery was allowed to leave detention while the proceedings continue quashing the minister's decision to not revoke the visa cancellation. And the matter was remitted back to the minister for determination in accordance with the reasons for the judge's judgment. And we have not yet heard the results of that reconsideration. In the meantime, the Commonwealth is appealing the federal court decision on the granting of the writ of habeas corpus. In my remaining few minutes, I'm going to summarize briefly um, the arguments that will be put before the court. The Commonwealth argues first that leave to reopen Love Toms is not required because there's no ratio in that case. Montgomery responds there is a ratio, just as Bell states it clearly in paragraph 81. Uh, with the authorization of the other members of the majority, she uh, says that Aboriginal Australians, according to the Mabo tripartite test, are not within the reach of the aliens' power. Montgomery also says this ratio has been applied by the federal court. The Commonwealth then says that leave is required, it should be granted because there are material differences between the majority judgments. Um, the resulting uncertainty also means there are difficulties with the practical administration of the test. Uh, they also dispute the scope of the Pochi qualification. They say it only applies where there is no possible view that a person is an alien in um, the ordinary understanding of that word. In other parts of its argument, the Commonwealth says that not all Aboriginal people have a connection with Australia. Some, they say, have stronger connections to other countries. They say a connection to land and waters does not mean there is a comparable connection to the Australian body politic. And that accepting the recognition decisions of elders or other persons enjoying, enjoying traditional authority amounts to an implicit and impermissible recognition of the political sovereignty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, in part because it concedes to a subgroup more power than is currently held by the states and territories. Montgomery argues that a connection with Australia is a connection with the body politic. It is the body politic that affords the relevant status and recognition to Aboriginal Australians. And they say Love Toms is not an abrogation of sovereignty, it is actually an exercise of sovereignty, and that is of the court interpreting the constitution. Finally, on the question of biological descent and cultural adoption, in response to the Commonwealth claims that Montgomery is not an Aboriginal Australian because he does not point to biological descent from an Indigenous person, Montgomery points out that the trial judge has not made findings on this evidence because this part of the application was removed to the High Court, that the question raises serious implications for other areas of law, including native title, and that if it is to be addressed, it should be done on the basis of a full factual and evidentiary record at trial. If Montgomery is required to argue this point in the High Court, he says he would argue that membership of Aboriginal societies by adoption can be established by traditional laws and customs, point out that some native title determinations make this clear, and say that biological descent cannot in any case be reduced to genes, as the Commonwealth argues. And finally, that difficulty of proof is not a reason to refuse proper consideration of the matter. So in sum, 
The Commonwealth argues that Love Tongs is wrong because, quote, the rules governing membership of the political community of Australia are the same for everyone, end quote. But this is also a case about the unique connection that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have to country and to land and waters and the constitutional significance of that connection. So happily, we have two of the very best expert commentators here with us today, the best we could hope for um, with their, their combined expertise on these issues to help us understand how this issue could or should evolve as the High Court begins its deliberations and beyond. So Tony, uh, we'll start with you, if you don't mind. Um, thank you, Kirsty. Uh, thank you, Adrian. I um, express my gratitude to the Melbourne Law School for uh, bringing this series forward. Um, I acknowledge the Wurundjeri people in this country, the, the law school situated. I also acknowledge the uh, Larrakia people on whose country I'm uh, presently living and uh, working. Um, and uh, I, I acknowledge my, my people, the Rudy people, Central Queensland, who, um, who uh, we, we have uh, felt the brunt of Western law in recent times. Uh, I was um, particularly disturbed about this case for a number of reasons, both as a, a wordy man and a lawyer. Uh, I, I found on a number of levels it, it troubled me, but um, today I'm only speaking about the issues of identity and, and alienage. Uh, and so I would hope that the, the audience understands that I approach this issue of identity uh, of First Nations people with all the insight I have as a, as a ready man, but also with the extensive experience I have in navigating the recognition of rights and interests in the native title context for that has allowed me to travel very widely and observe the ways in which my brothers and sisters, my fellow First Nations people uh, go about identifying themselves and their, their neighbours. I want to start with my conception of my own First Nations identity. I put it this way. At the most fundamental level, my ancestors were the people with the legal and cultural authority over their country. And I have inherited uh, that authority. This legal and cultural authority existed within a defined territory. And for all intents and purposes, was the same form of sovereignty that was recognized by the International Court of Justice in the advisory opinion on the Western Sahara in 1975. My ancestors, existed as members or citizens within a body politic, having territorial integrity, religion, law, and a distinct culture. That body politic had the capacity to determine its own membership. The rules about the recognition of individuals as members can and do change. One instance of this, of which some people will be familiar from the native title context, is the ready, ready acceptance of the, of the courts of evidence going to the existence of a, a primary mechanism for acquisition of, of identity uh, being inheritance through the patriline, through one's father's look in, in pre-invasion times. But in post-invasion times, that emphasis having shifted and descent through the matriline or the patriline, having become equally acceptable. There is room for change. This conception of my 
nationality, my identity, I think is largely reflected in the international human rights instruments. Uh, of, namely, of course, in the uh, International Covenant on Civil Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. But also in Article 3 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which provides that Indigenous peoples are entitled to the right to self-determination. For, for those who are unfamiliar with Article 3, it reads, Indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, cultural development. One of the most fundamental aspects of the right to self-determination is, is the right to determine uh, one's own citizenship. My people freely determine our political status by continuing to, to assert uh, our sovereignty, by continuing to uh, uh, demand the right and exercising the right to make decisions about our country, and by continuing to make decisions about the membership uh, of our citizenry, amongst other matters. So understood um, in this way, I think it can be appreciated that if you cannot, if, if a group cannot determine its own citizenship, then uh, the right to self-determination uh, may become quite meaningless. Uh, I just want to go back to the, the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, I, I read for you a moment ago Article 3, but I also want to take you to Articles 9 and 33, which, or 33.1, which express uh, these principles in, a, in perhaps clearer terms. Article 9 provides Indigenous peoples and individuals have the right to belong to an Indigenous community or nation in accordance with the traditions and customs of the community or nation concerned. No discrimination of any kind may arise from the exercise of such a right. And Article 33.1 reads, Indigenous peoples have the right to determine their own identity or membership in accordance with their customs and traditions. This does not impair the right of, the, of Indigenous individuals to obtain citizenship of the states in which they live. I think it's, it's probably hard to imagine that it could be more plainly said in an international instrument. So where does Australia stand on the acquisition of First Nations identity? Um, in native title uh, law, we often term, uh, speak of the acquisition of, of rights and the acquisition of identity. And in most of the cases that I've worked in, um, the, the acquisition of identity occurs at birth. Uh, it occurs by reason of uh, your uh, bloodline uh, connection to your ancestors and to your country. Um, in my view, there has been a bit of a, a tendency to conflate indigeneity uh, with the possession of a First Nations identity. Uh, again, using myself as an example, I suppose it might be said that I am an Aboriginal person. But from my perspective, that is a third or fourth order level of identif identification. It would be the same as referring to Europeans from a particular country as Caucasian. It says nothing of their cultural or spiritual origins. However, however for political expediency, that is the level at which First Nations people were characterised in this country and continue to be. Uh, I, I remind uh, the audience that um, in 1768, in Cook's secret instructions, and then in Philip's draft instructions from 1787, the first people of this con continent were referred to as natives. Aborigine, or the term Aboriginal came into use very early in the colony, but the first 
legislative definition of an Aboriginal native, of which I'm aware, uh, is found in the Aborigines Protection Act 1869 in Victoria. It provided at section eight, every Aboriginal native of Australia and every Aboriginal half-caste or child of a half-caste, such half-caste or child habitually associating and living with Aboriginals shall be deemed to be an Aboriginal within the meaning of this act. And at the hearing of any case, the justice adjudicating may, in the absence of sufficient evidence, decide on his own view and judgment whether a person with, with reference to whom any proceedings shall have been taken under this act is or is not an Aboriginal. It's well known that the Tasmanian dams case was, uh, was the, the most uh, high profile and recent uh, judicial pronouncement on the test of Aboriginality um, prior to Love and Tom's. Uh, yeah. That was, uh, in contrast to that case though, we had in 1976, the enactment of uh, the Aboriginal Land Rights Act of the Northern Territory, which provides that traditional Aboriginal owners are the local descent group having the spiritual responsibility for the particular area of land. And in 1992, the Mabo decision, of course, was the occasion on which the notion of acceptance by those with the traditional authority uh, was applied on a local basis. Uh, by this, I'm referring to the difference between the, the formulation in the Tasmanian dams case, where one could be accepted by uh, Aboriginal uh, community in which one lives, as opposed to uh, being accepted by those with the traditional authority for the, for the lands, the subject of the claim in, in, in Mabo. This case, I think the Mabo case brought the generalised nations of uh, homogenous uh, pan-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander identity uh, firmly into the realm of the traditional law and, uh, and also the international law requirements, I think, for a local identity. That's a, an identity attached to uh, the country. Uh, I should add, though, that in Mabo, the description maintained the notions of uh, biological descent and assertion of identity as the first and second limbs of the tripartite test. It's not clear to me that, they, that these conditions originate in Aboriginal law. It might be argued that they are government overlays. Having said that, it is not my place to say whether the First Nations law relating to membership of any First Nations uh, land and body politic permits entry to those uh, that are not First Nations people or biological descendants or people who do not self-identify. I can only make those observations about my own people. This uh, membership of a First Nation, uh, I, I think, is not to be confused with the rights to speak for country or live on country or use country. Um, the acquisition of those rights are primarily dependent upon bloodline, but in some places are acquired uh, by reason of the place of one's birth and the acquisition of knowledge uh, um, about uh, important places. In many, though, uh, and if not most uh, First Nations, uh, mechanisms for adoption or incorporation of other First Nations people exist or existed. In Love and Tom's, there was discussion of native title rights holding groups in the context of a continuing spiritual relationship such as that held by a First Nation body politic possessing the right to self-determine. This does not seem to me to be inconsistent at all because the native title holders for a particular country uh, I believe will always be members of or citizens of uh, 
the landed uh, body politic, but they may not be the totality of that group. The linkage of status to native title rights, I think is a useful device in communicating the essential relationship of First Nations people with country. But in the, in the context of the present debate, uh, it's unnecessary. What is being recognised is the existence of an Indigenous people or First Nation that has its origins pre-invasion and, uh, and those, uh, th that existence continues. That nation has had and continues to have a relationship with the lands and the waters that is recognised in First Nations law, understood by international law, and is not derived from the British law or locally made Australian law. That nation can determine its citizenry, in my view. The decision in Love and Tom's was determined on the basis that the constitutional alien power, aliens power could not have been intended to apply to Aboriginal people because of that distinct, distinctly spiritual relationship Aboriginal people have with their lands and waters. Uh, uh, means, uh, of course, that we are quintessentially connected to the to the continent. The majority were in agreement in this regard. Uh, in my view, the decision could have been formulated around the right to discern, self-determine as a collective right. Thus, a First Nations citizen would only gain protection and, and as a member of a self-determining group of, of Indigenous people. I should add, that I accept that the right to self-determination is still a Western articulation of a right, uh, where what we're speaking of is the essence of existence and religion and spirituality. Of course, the present day right to self-determine as a First Nation was not uh, at the time of commencement of the constitution yet conceived of at least in the modern sense, or by the drafters, but the fundamental collective spiritual relationship of uh, Aboriginal people to our lands is well known. Uh, the, the historical records bear out that it was understood even in, that, in those days. To be clear, it is not the individual possession of native title rights that would have found the distinction but the membership of the body politic and in my view the self-determining landed body, body politic as I describe it. I will add that uh, this uh, case uh, leaves me somewhat troubled that the determination of questions pertaining to Indigenous identity falls to a court composed of people who are not members of any First Nations body politic or even a, a Native title rights holding group. Uh, their appreciation of the complexity of the issues uh, through a Western lens as it must be, and by no fault of them, their own, leaves them unable to view these very fundamental issues of identity and religion and spirituality as anything other than an outsider. Yes, of course, I accept that the British and Australian Parliament have uh, created and enacted a constitution and laws which apply to this continent. And according to those laws, the government of Australia regulates issues such as who may enter and stay within its boundaries. I also accept that an invading power such as, for instance, Russia or Britain may make laws to the effect that it will give certain people a certain label. But no matter which way you approach the issue of First Nations people, that invading government or that new government cannot tell those citizens, those people, sorry, those nations, who their citizens are. Only the First Nations can make those decisions. Each First Nation by its own rules. So an invading power may choose to ignore those decisions. But in Australia, 
having recognised that we have extant rights, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the First Nations people, have extant rights and interests in lands and borders, and that we determine the membership of the group of people with whom we share those rights. It seems to me to be too late to suggest we have not retained that aspect of the right to self-determination. I will leave it there. I um, invite questions. I have purposely stayed away from certain aspects of the case and um, may decline to, uh, to answer questions if they go to places I'm not prepared to comment on. Um, I, um, I might hand back now to Kirsty. Thanks, Tony. Um, you've very eloquently reminded us that Australia is a legally plural society and that the great challenge uh, and responsibility is on non-Indigenous institutions and officials to come to terms with that fact. Uh, I think what we might do is save questions until after both of our panellists have spoken. Um, so it's my great pleasure now to hand over to uh, Professor Cheryl Saunders. Over to you, Cheryl. Thanks, Kirsty, uh, and good evening, everyone. Um, let me begin with an acknowledgement of country two. Uh, I acknowledge that I am presently on the lands of the Bunwarung people, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Shortly after Love Toms was decided, I wrote a blog post. And in that post, I suggested that one of the reasons the case was both so important and so difficult was that it involved the intersection of two fault lines in Australian constitutionalism. One is the incomplete project of reconciling the legal foundations of Australia as a settled colony with the reality, finally settled in Mabo, that Australia had long since been occupied by other people with laws and customs of their own, and having what Tony just described as a quintessential relationship with country. Nation building to adequately recognize this reality is a continuing work in progress. The second fault line is the absence of specific provision for citizenship in the Australian constitution. When the constitution came into force in 1901, Australia was not yet independent, and the status of belonging that the constitution assumed was British subject, possibly tempered by residence. Once Australia became independent, this was no longer satisfactory and a statutory uh, status of Australian citizen was created. The only continuing status for which the constitution provided, however, was the status of alien in a Commonwealth head of power, which Australia shared with Canada authorizing federal legislation for naturalization, which is a process, and for alien, which is a status. The relationship between alien as a constitutional term and the statutory reach of citizenship has been an ongoing problem ever since, was it played out partly in the context of British immigrants to Australia with long connections to Australia, but without formal Australian citizenship. The rejection of these claims, arguably, was part of the evolutionary story of Australian independence. But in Love Toms, the problem was revived in the entirely different context of Australia's own First Peoples. Revisiting these issues for tonight in the light of the challenge in Montgomery, I was struck again by the way in which these two fault lines intersect. They also help to explain why it's possible to approach this litigation from very different perspectives one, the perspective of Indigenous law, rights and identity, uh, which Tony just spoke about um, in such an extraordinarily interesting fashion. And the other, the perspective of constitutional law. Uh, in tonight's uh, seminar, I want to take the latter, although of course the challenge to resolving the important questions in this case uh, is to bring both these perspectives together. So in my remarks tonight, I want to take up two of the main points of a constitutional kind arising from the written submissions in Montgomery so far. The first is the Commonwealth's challenge to Love Toms as a precedent that the Montgomery court should follow, and I'll call that the precedent point. The second is whether the aliens power supports the valid application of the deportation from Australia of someone in the position of Mont Montgomery assuming that he satisfies the relevant tests of identity, and I'll call this the power point. And if time permits, 
I'll conclude by suggesting that pursuing these issues through litigation is not the only nor necessarily the best way of resolving them. And this might be called the responsibility point. The Commonwealth puts the precedent point in two main ways. And Kirsty touched on this in her remarks as well. The first is that there's no binding ratio in love toms. And the second is that if there is a ratio, the decision should be overturned. The argument about the absence of ratio is likely to provide future fodder for generations of commencing law students. Consider the problem. Each of the four majority justices in Love Toms delivered separate reasons with some variations both in the manner in which they concluded that Aboriginal Australians were not within the reach of the aliens' power and in the immediate application of their conclusions to Mr Love. Nevertheless, each also authorised the most senior puny judge, Justice Bell, to include the statement in her reasons that Kirstie led out, but just let me remind you of, I'm authorised by the other members of the majority to say that although we express our reasoning differently, we agree that Aboriginal Australians, as defined, are not within the reach of the aliens' power. So is there a ratio in these circumstances? The Commonwealth argues not, drawing attention to the earlier line of cases in which the court ultimately held that there was no agreed basis on which a non-citizen, non-alien status had been co constructed. In relation to the categories of applicants there concerned, however, here also there's some agreement about the parameters, some disagreement about the parameters of the category of Aboriginal Australians to whom the finding applies, but there's no disagreement about the category. Itself. The argument about overturning raises issues of a constitutional kind as well. There's no doubt that the High Court can and will overturn its previous decisions, but it's slow to do so, and such a submission requires leave of the court. There's some authority about the factors that the court will consider in overturning, and the Commonwealth submissions explore uh, a range of these, arguing that they fall in its favour. And they include things like other material differences in reasoning amongst the majority in the earlier case. Was the earlier case worked out over a succession of cases? Are there uncertainties in its application, including in administration? Is this a question of vital constitutional importance? The Commonwealth argues that uh, Australian sovereignty is at stake. And has the decision be, been independently acted upon? The respondents variously dispute these claims or turn the factor to their own advantage. And they also refer in passing to the elephant in the room. The one thing that has changed since Love Toms was decided is the composition of the court. Two of the majority justices have retired and their replacements necessarily have been chosen by the same government that is bringing the challenge. Neither side suggests that this has a direct bearing on the proceedings, but the optics are problematic. It may be worth noting also that a situation like this occurred once before in another case where the court was asked to overrule a recent, somewhat contentious precedent decided by a narrow majority, one member of which had since left the court. On this occasion, while the new judge cast his vote in favor of the former minority position, one of the former minority justices switched sides, apparently as a matter of principle. So now to the point about power. The substance of the challenge in the, the, the substantive challenge in the case resolve, revolves around the scope of the legislative power conferred on the Parliament of the Commonwealth by section 51, 20, uh, 19 of the constitution, and in particular, the meaning of one word, alien. Earlier litigation on the term has tended to support the view that generally an alien could be equated with a non-citizen. Generally, but not quite. In the qualification expressed by Chief Justice Gibbs in Pochi, which, um, to which uh, we earlier referred, and endorsed by the High Court repeatedly since this was said, Parliament cannot, simply by giving its own definition of alien, expand the power under section 5119 to include persons who could not possibly answer the description of aliens in the ordinary understanding 
And that I think is a fairly orthodox approach to interpreting a, a constitutional term. One way of thinking about the PowerPoint in Montgomery is to ask how this qualification applies in relation to Indigenous Australians and in relation to Mr Montgomery himself. In Love Toms, the majority justices held that the alien's power did not extend to Aboriginal Australians, at least if they satisfied the tripartite Mabo test. The minority, in contrast, treated alien as effectively, and this is their word, the antonym of citizenship. In its Montgomery submissions, the Commonwealth develops this position as follows. According to the Commonwealth, the alien's power has two aspects, one of which enables the parliament to define the circumstances that make someone an alien, and one of which enables the parliament to legislate for such persons. Only the first, says the Commonwealth, is in issue here. An alien, therefore, is a person not committed to membership of the Australian body politic in accordance with the citizenship tests laid down by the parliament in legislation. The majority argues that citizen, uh, the, the Commonwealth argues that citizenship, therefore, is a statutory concept with constitutional significance, quite a new idea. Pochi means that the Commonwealth cannot choose citizenship criteria that on no possible view could identify an alien, say the submissions, but that's not the case here. Birth, descent, and foreign nationality were all criteria with which the common law was familiar in 1901. And nor should there be a sui generis exception for Indigenous Australians, the submissions continue, for reasons that include the following. Alien does not have an essential meaning, not being, and here I quote, as linguistically determinate as lighthouses, a comparison that only Australians could understand. To allow an exception uh, to the, um, to the um, just juxtaposition between citizenship and alien would add words to section 5119. And the claimed basis for an exception lies through connection to land rather than membership of the body politic, which is what is required for citizenship. Now, we can perhaps pursue some of these points uh, in uh, uh, question time, but whatever their technical merits, and I'm by no means convinced of the, the two aspects analysis, or at least this usage of it, these arguments fill me with unease. And if I try to articulate the nature of that une unease, it's something along the following lines, and I may not have this quite right yet. This isn't an analysis that reflects the realities of modern Australia, or indeed of the issues before the court. It makes no sense, no more sense to me to decide whether Indigenous Australians are members of the Australian body politic by reference to common law concepts of membership shaped by 400 or more years of British history than it did to decide on questions of indigenous interests in land in accordance with the common law shaped by the same historic process. The common law was adapted to accommodate indigenous interests in land uh, in the light of indigenous law and culture in Mabo and properly so. As a country, we have benefited greatly from that decision. And the rather inchoate provision for citizenship and alienage in the Australian constitution offers a broadly similar opportunity to shape the understanding of membership of the Australian body politic in a way that reflects the unique position of Indigenous Australians. So Kirsty, let me close briefly on what I described earlier as the responsibility point. I was really taken back when I first heard of the challenge in Love Toms. It seemed to me that the proposition that Indigenous people might be deported under a power to make laws for aliens didn't come even near to meeting the famous Australian pub test. Given the novelty of the issues perhaps raised in that case and the mandatory framing of the legislation, uh, perhaps we can see with hindsight that it was difficult to avoid lit litigation then. But now uh, we we're several years uh, on. The Commonwealth submissions place great stress on uncertainty about the precise parameters of the people affected by Love Toms and, and about the inconvenience in administration of the legislation. All of this suggests to me 
that at the latest in the wake of Love Toms, it might have been considered to be the responsibility of the Commonwealth Parliament to tidy up its legislation, to make allowance for the distinctive position of Indigenous Australians rather than pursuing litigation. This indeed was the approach taken in Mabo. I acknowledge that the legislative solution when it comes may not be easy, but nor was it in Mabo. And reflecting on Mabo, including the roles played by Indigenous leaders in crafting the initial Native Title Act, it strikes me how much easier it would be to draft legislation to tidy up the loose ends following Love Toms if there were an Indigenous voice with the necessary status. Wearing my comparative constitutional law hat, may I also add that Australia is unlikely to be the only country in the world in which questions of the Indigenous membership of the body politic have arisen. North America, Latin America and Scandinavia, amongst others, must surely have experiences of this kind on which Australia could draw in reaching a solution that is workable and applicable here. Thanks, Kirsten. Wonderful. Thank you, Cheryl, for your insights. Um, excellent, as expected. So I think um, we're reaching the point where we need to wind up our conversation today. I think it's clear, as you've explained, Tony, and, and you've agreed, Cheryl, that, um, that what's needed is Indigenous judges on the High Court and a lot more Indigenous legal professionals. And I'm saying that with a, with a thought of our Indigenous JDs. Um, this is a, the type of area of law that really needs to be informed properly by legal analysis brought by people who are practitioners of Indigenous law. Um, I would like to thank both of you for your, your candor and your generosity in joining us today. Um, thanks to both of you, both on behalf of the CCCS and also the Indigenous Law and Justice Hub. Um, I'll hand over for any closing remarks and then we might um, bring our conversation to an end for today. Um, well, I'll go first, uh, Kirsty. I, I uh, again wanted to uh, thank um, the organisers for, for um, bringing this event forward. I'd like to uh, thank all the people who have joined and, and asked questions. Um, this case, um, I think the, the result of it is, is never going to satisfy everybody. There will be complaints um, no matter which way it's decided. And um, this, I mean, it, 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 it perhaps is the, uh, the only way it can play out at the moment, but it's, uh, I repeat what I said earlier, is that I think that there's a better way to do it. Um, and I would you know, like to see us having those more uh, informed and mature and uh, conversations in the not too distant future. Yeah, mm. thank you. And thanks, Cheryl. I enjoyed uh, your presentation greatly. I, I enjoyed yours too, Tony. Uh, uh, yes, look, just a final concluding observation from me, Kirsty. Um, you know, this is a very complicated case uh, um, with a number of different issues, some of which neither of us managed to quite get to. Mm. Um, and it's impossible, of course, just in sort of quarter of an hour or so to do justice to the, to the arguments. But I hope that we've succeeded in sketching for people uh, some of the things that are at stake. They're very important, um, clearly important from the standpoint uh, of Indigenous identity and rights, um, but also uh, very important, I think, from the standpoint uh, of the Australian polity and Australian uh, constitutional law. So I, for one, uh, will be reading the next round of submissions with considerable interest. And can I just close, Kirsty, by thanking you. Um, you've really shepherded this seminar through in the most thoughtful way from, from weeks ago. A lot of work's gone into uh, preparing this. Um, your remarks opening up the seminar were very, very helpful as a base on which to build. So thanks a lot. Thanks to you both. And for everyone here today, I encourage you to follow the media, follow this case. It's a critical one. And, um, and tune in next time for the next um, seminar in this new, newish series hosted by the CCCS at Melbourne Law School. Thanks to all. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.